Um, but if we were to have a do-over, I don't think that this is how we would design society. We wouldn't come up with this really elaborate tax code, and we wouldn't come up with this really ineffective education system. We wouldn't have a really corrupted court system. And I don't think that we would place um, anywhere near as much power in the hands of representatives as we do. I don't think that if we had a do-over, this is how we would design our society. Um, Governments and sovereign people all over the world are trying to find a way to change our social structures or our societal structures. But we as the citizens who will be effective are left out of the conversation. When, when are we going to say, finally, that we're paying attention and we want to say, we want to have a seat at the table? Um, so, I guess that's, that's my question, is when are we going to accept responsibility and say we want a seat at this table? We want to have a say in how our future um, is going to roll out before us, because there are people in governments, um, heads of corporations, um, all over the world that are deciding this stuff right now. And we don't ever get to hear the conversations. We don't ever get to hear the pr proposals. And we don't, we're not ever exposed to what the possibilities are. So I think that's where I want to end it. I want this talk tonight, I mean. I want to establish that we need to start demanding more of a seat at the table. So if y'all like that, let's call it good. Okay. All right, now I'm done. Okay. So, what do you think? Does that, is it, it's a lot when you think about our, our reality structures, our, the possibility that our reality structures could be changing right now, and we don't, we're not even aware of it. That's something that really kind of, um, it doesn't rub me the wrong way, but it makes me feel like, where have I been? How come I haven't been paying attention to this? And it makes me feel a little bit guilty that I didn't know that these types of alternate societies have been being designed, and I wasn't paying attention. Does anybody have any feedback on that? No. She's her brain's thinking. Yeah. Thinking. Yeah. Sure. I'm wondering, like, what would a seat at the table even look like? You know, something that I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, every bill, every uh, piece of legislation that's passed, every um, federal act that goes through the Senate or the Congress or anything like that. Um, why do they bother having representatives vote on this stuff for us? Why don't they just, on the White House website, put up an argument for the bill and an argument against the bill? And you go and you read and you decide what you think it, uh, the way that you think it should go. Why isn't, why isn't, why has, why in like, the, one of the most advanced countries in the world, have we not figured out a way to um, populate the White House website with info for the people? Like, that's, that's bananas. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I agree. Um, and I think that that just goes back to, um, if it's not broke, don't fix it mentality, you know? Um, but I think that that's part of what a seat at the table would look like. Inform us. You know, you hear about 2,200 page bills that never get read, and then people just vote on them. And then the next thing you know, we have things like the Patriot Act, where completely, it completely removes habeas corpus, your right to privacy, um, 
and nobody, no, nobody brings that up anymore, you know? And that's how, that stuff, that's how we get those things taken away from us, is these bills are written to be um, unintelligible, and then they're passed without anyone ever reading them. Um, I think that if we had a requirement that it had to be maybe 10 pages or less, in, not in legalese, but in plain English that the average person could understand, and maybe you can't sign into Facebook until you vote it, you know? You have to vote on one thing for the day, and you can't sign into fa to Facebook until you do it, you know? I don't know what a seat at the table would look like, but I really want one. I think that we all deserve it. Deserve's maybe not the right word, but an entitled's not the right word either, because I think that you should um, have to earn a seat at the table for sure. But, um, there's, there's got to be a better way to do it than what we're doing right now. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I am really inspired by the um, ASRAC, ASRAC? I think it's ASRAC, uh, refugee camp, because they, I mean, you know, diamonds are created under pressure, right? And like, here's this um, refugee camp that has almost no author no uh, police system or anything like that that's facing all of the problems that a large city would have, you know, like theft and crime, rape, murder, you know, all of these things. And they were like, this can't continue. We have to figure out a way to start building up some sort of community value in the individual and they've found a way to make technology help them do that. That to me is so inspiring. And it makes me wonder, you know, how long before us over here, where we're, maybe we don't have quite so much pressure, but um, I think we certainly have the motivation to be able to look at where our technology is right now and make it work for us. Yeah, so I was really inspired by that story. Huh? So we are so lucky to have what we have here for building a refugee camp. Being I know. A woman in the Middle East. I know. And here we are on a Monday evening drinking beer and enjoying a really nice conversation, you know? Um, and that one, that, that camp was uh, 35,000 people, I believe. There's one about 50 miles to the north of it, northeast of it. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's 130,000 refugees in that camp. And we just have no reference to what that kind of life is like here. Yeah. Um, I think that maybe as an American, like our tendency is to feel guilty that we have it so good. But I don't feel guilty, but I do feel very responsible. I feel like if, you know, if we're starting so far ahead and these people are at such a deficit, it makes me feel very responsible to help, um, not, maybe not necessarily help these individual refugees, but to help change what's causing it in the first place. It makes me feel really responsible. What do you think? You got something on your mind? I'm just kind of thinking about, I'm wondering how the refugees and the uh, blockchain, like, because that's currency, but it's mm -hmm. also a way to manage people? Yes. Do you know how they're doing it? Um, because a lot of these people don't have, like, you know, you can't carry around a wallet. You're going to get pickpocketed or robbed. It's an iris scan. So these people go to the grocery store, they scan their iris, it says, oh, you have this much in this in vouchers, and you're the only one that can redeem these, and then you just scan, get what you want. This is in the refugee camps? In, yep, in Jordan. Wow. They're, so the World uh, Food Program, they, they 
and I'd love, I was looking before our talk today to see if I could find an update, but I couldn't find an update. Um, but they started off with 10,000. 10,000 individuals that they wanted to get on this system um, is, you know, like the beta version. Um, but that was late 2017, so, and I think that at that time, all going well, they wanted to up that to 100,000 refugees on the system. Um, so there's nothing that, there's no piece of technology that the participants have to hold. They're, they don't have to show proof of ID right. or, and they don't have to, the most important thing, they don't have to carry vouchers anymore. So they can't be robbed. I mean, I guess somebody could cut out their eyeball if they really wanted to just hold it up and scan it. I don't know how effective that would be, especially in a grocery store, but. <laughs> Right, like, oh, let me just, let me just pay for that. But that's kind of crazy if you think about it. Like, I, I picture a refugee camp being like very um, militarized, like very, uh, you know, block and block and block and block of like very cold, kind of unwelcoming environment. Um, you know, and it's an it, it's a desert that they're in. So it's not like it's a very and actually the people from that uh, from Azraq say like it's not welcoming. It's not a nice environment. We don't feel like homey here. But yet here's this like absurdly advanced technology that all of these people are using. It's, it's just so interesting to me, like what a contrast that is. You know, these people who have almost nothing and they're getting to utilize some of the most advanced technology in the world. That's pretty wonderful. And it's solving problems for them. It feels like it's fitting for an environment like that, but I don't know how I feel about it in a more civilized, more normal civilization. Yeah, because it seems it, like some nefarious thing well, that yeah i'm tying that with like the chinese the social, social crediting credit thing mm -hmm. and i'm like that rubs me wrong oh yeah i'm like that's dictating that's that feels really controlling mm -hmm. and not free mm -hmm. and i don't so I, I, so it's similar though what they're doing at those camps um kind of because all of their all of their wealth is, I mean, keep in mind that these, this camp in particular is completely um, dependent on humanitarian aid. So I don't want to, I don't want to say wealth, but all of the, all of these people's resources are tied to this technology, um, which, yeah, like when you think of that in a refugee situation, that seems ideal, right? Because nobody can rob you of that. Right. But in in a regular not in a war zone not um you know in regular day-to-day -day life i don't want to get my iris scanned to go grocery shopping i don't you know but i don't think i don't think that americans would ever go for that honestly i don't think that they would i think that it's too um total recall for them it's too uh, like you said, government control for them. And Americans are so anti-government control that I don't think that anything like that would ever fly. Do you remember when uh, the Nexus guy, his name was Chris, he came to town and he was pushing that Nexus pay with your finger. Um, I didn't, I just, I remember like telling him, he came in for a haircut. And I remember telling him, that's not going to work. That's not going to work in a rapid scene. He's like, oh, no, people are really responding well to it. And I said, well, yeah, the owners, the shop owners maybe are. But when you've got people who are coming up to pay for their stuff and you want them to register their fingerprint, that's not going to fly. And it didn't. It didn't. He made a real, real go of it. He told me something interesting, though. And it stuck with me ever since, ever since. Um, I said, why in the world, because he actually was working for, the company Nexus came from Czechoslovakia, 
And I said, why are you in Rapid City, South Dakota, if you work in Czechoslovakia? That doesn't make any sense to me. And he said, it, it's well known in marketing. If you can make something work in Rapid City, South Dakota, you can make it work anywhere. And I said, shut up. Shut up. Why? And he said, because it's your demographics. You have a very wealthy population and an extremely poor population, everything in between and almost every minority. And I just thought that was interesting and I never forgot that he told me that. Yeah. But um, I, yeah, so I'm with you. I don't, I don't see Americans going for that kind of high grade uh, uh, biometrics, you know, being tied so tightly to what we would consider social credit or even our finances? No, I don't. I don't see that ever happening. Yeah. All right. I think we're all done. You think we're done? Yeah. I got off my chest, but I had to get off my chest for sure. Okay. Good. Um, you can stop the recording. Oh, that's right. Next week, I'm going to tell you guys a story. It's um, kind of an epic story. It's a little bit, it has um, some romance and it has um, kings and conquerors and um, it's a true example of how what you decide to participate in can not only change your reality, but also change the reality for millions and millions of people. <coughs> not just now, but farther into the future than you could ever imagine. So that's what we're going to do next time. I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah. All right. Thank you, ladies, for coming. Thank you.